Greetings and salutations, today we'll be covering the perplexing case of Jennifer Kesey's vanishing. This young resident of Florida vanished on January 23rd, 2006, and her vanishing was so confusing that it left investigators and her loved ones grasping for answers. On the eve of her disappearance, she engaged in her routine, which involved making calls before bed, and her last known call was to her boyfriend, Robert Allen, at about 10 p.m. Little would anyone know that this would be the final moments of normalcy before her vanishing. This case takes a rather chilling turn. When her vehicle, which would eventually become a major clue in the investigation, was found abandoned roughly about a mile from her residence. Grainy surveillance footage also showed an enigmatic figure parking the car before casually strolling away. And despite extensive scrutiny, the quality of the footage failed to yield any discernible features, leaving investigators grappling with more questions than answers. The days leading up to her disappearance would be seemingly ordinary, marked by a blissful getaway with her significant other to the US Virgin Islands. However, the tranquility of the retreat swiftly disappeared upon the return, as the victim would quickly resume her responsibilities with what was marked as unwavering diligence. Despite relentless efforts of both local and national authorities, the case would remain shrouded in ambiguity. As no one was able to figure out Kesey's whereabouts and the mysterious figure caught on the surveillance footage remained unidentified. It would be on January 24, 2006, when friends and family of Jennifer Keesley embarked on a grim mission armed with flyers. They scoured the streets, desperate for even the slightest hint of information regarding the whereabouts of the missing 24-year-old Floridian. And by the following day, it seemed her disappearance had echoed nationwide. It seems the initial suspicions of her disappearance actually came from her workplace, as her colleagues at the Central Florida Investments Timeshare Company noted her conspicuous absence being contrary to her punctuality and dedication to the job. Having found her now abandoned vehicle was a great boon for the investigation. However, it was her domicile that was the eeriest of tableaus, as her parents and investigators would discover her belongings lay scattered. Apparently, her life had been abruptly halted. A damp towel, along with meticulously laid out clothing, bared witness to her suspicious vanishing. To better understand things, a timeline has been constructed based on witness statements. Monday, January 23rd, 2006, 6 p.m. Kessie leaves work and calls her parents. This would be the last time her direct family would hear from her. She arrived home for the first time since having left for her vacation. 10 p.m. She and her boyfriend talk over the phone and say their goodnights. He is the last known person to speak with her before her disappearance. Tuesday, January 24th, 2006, 7.30 a.m. to 8 a.m. Investigators initially believe that the victim was abducted as she was walking from her front door to her car. However, now they believe that she left and was abducted on her way to work. 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. The victim's boyfriend, whom she would normally call, calls her on her way to work. However, he is sent directly to voicemail, which he initially chalks up to her being at a meeting that she had mentioned previously. His subsequent attempts are likewise unsuccessful. The victim's parents would eventually call him to say she had failed to show up at work. 11 a.m. Now alarmed at the victim's uncharacteristic no-call, no-show behavior, her employer contacts her parents directly, which leads them to driving from Tampa to Orlando in order to check on their daughter. On their way, they call to ask the manager of her condominium if he may check to see if she's home with the spare key that he would have. From a cursory glance, he goes on to report that everything appears normal inside, but that her car was missing. 12 p.m. at about 1.2 miles from the victim's home, surveillance cameras at an apartment complex recorded a person parking her car and walking away. However, the car and the footage would not be discovered until two days later. 3 to 3.15, the victim's parents and brothers would arrive at her apartment. They find evidence that she was home that morning, leading to them calling the police. As the victim is an adult, the police initially hold that she might have left of her own volition. 5 to 7, the victim's family and friends saturated the area with flyers, and it would be around this time that the police would send a detective over to her home in order to begin interrogations and start searching the crime scene. 
Thursday, January 26, 2006, 8 10 a.m. Seeing the victim's car on the news, a tenant of a nearby apartment complex informs the police that it has sat abandoned in front of their apartment for several days. The police would quickly confirm that this is the victim's 2004 Chevy Malibu. The vehicle is photographed and taken for forensic examination. The police would also examine local surveillance footage and discover that an unidentified person was the one who parked the car and walked away. With the vehicle now in the confines of the police forensic lab, investigators believed that they would have a breakthrough. However, much to their disappointment, the car really had nothing of value. A few traces of DNA and a latent print was all they could get from the vehicle. This information was recounted by her father in a candid interview with Fox News. With the absence of her personal effects, such as her cell phone and her purse, investigators were left scrambling for clues. And in the absence of any tangible leads, one thing was noted, that her bank account had shown no activity. At minimum, this would disperse. This was a kidnapping, which was intended to function as a robbery. However, there was one potential lead. Captured on film, a person of interest who was shrouded in anonymity. However, since their features were obscured by the technological limitations, it seemed this lead was to no avail. In a bid to move the case forward, investigators turned to NASA, requesting their aid to enhance the grainy footage. Unfortunately, despite their best efforts, the person of interest remained a faceless specter. Two potential suspects would quickly be investigated and cleared. Their alibis solidified under the scrutiny of intense investigation. The victim's boyfriend along with her brother. There was even an ex-lover who had harbored aspirations of rekindling their relationship, who was also cleared in the eyes of the law. Later, in 2018, the victim's family resolved to enact a lawsuit against the Orlando Police Department in a desperate bid to pry open the Pandora's box of secrets concealed within the investigative records. Bill Gilmore, the victim's uncle, lay bare the department's initial reluctance, citing their dismissive stance on the significant evidence gleamed from the victim's vehicle. However, through dogged perseverance and unwavering determination, the family unearthed a trove of revelations, hidden behind a labyrinthian maze of bureaucratic obfuscation. A staggering cache of records laid bare the department's deception, exposing a clandestine collection of DNA evidence which had been concealed from prying eyes. Photos of the victim's vehicles, previously withheld from scrutiny, emerged as harbingers of truth, bearing witness to the telltale signs of a violent struggle etched upon its hood, contradicting the initial assumptions which were given to the family by the police. Yet amidst the tumult of legal wrangling, the specter of whether it was negligence or intentional malfeasance loomed large. Drew Kesey, the patriarch of the family, would go on to condemn the department's apathy and incompetence, accusing them of squandering precious opportunities for justice. The revelation that the lead detective on the victim's case had ceased all documentation efforts since 2010 cast a damning shadow over the department's credibility, and it was a stark reminder in the department's failure in upholding their oath of duty. In a bid to breathe new life into the faltering investigation, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement assumed control in November 2022, where hope flickered anew in the hearts of the victim's family as they pinned their aspirations and hopes on the prospect of fresh DNA testing leading to new avenues of investigation and potentially closure in the pursuit of truth. For the Kesey family, the road to closure is fraught with peril, in a crucible of despair and determination. Yet in their unwavering resolve, they have found solace, in a beacon of hope amidst the encroaching shadows of uncertainty. And as the wheels of justice now begin to grind inexorably forward, they stand on the precipice of truth, steadfast in their quest to unveil the fate of their beloved Jennifer. In the perplexing puzzle of Jennifer Keesley's disappearance, the plot seems to ever thicken with each twist and turn, leaving investigators and loved ones alike ensnared in a web of uncertainty, deception, and malfeasance. From the haunting haze of grainy surveillance footage to the clandestine collection and concealment of evidence, this case brims with tantalizing tidbits of truth 
as the curtains draw close on this enigmatic case, the Kessy family stands stalwart, persevering and unwavering in their quest for closure. With each legal skirmish and investigative endeavor, they navigate the labyrinthian landscape of litigation and the legal system with grit and grace, armed with fierce determination to unearth not only what occurred to Jennifer, but why the department worked so hard to conceal what they had done. Despite a fog of frustration and a storm of setbacks, they remain resolute, fueled by fervent hope that one day the shadows of uncertainty will dissipate and Jennifer's story will find its rightful resolution in the annals of justice. If you remained with me until the end, I thank you and I do hope you stay tuned and subscribe for more content.